Hello, my name is Dahlia Fisher. I'm Director of External Relations for the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage. On behalf of everyone at the museum, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight for such a special program. Tonight's program, In Our Backyard, Immigrant Voices of Cleveland, is in partnership with our friends at Global Cleveland and Literary Cleveland. Tonight culminates an exciting collaboration as we invite some of the writers who participated in Literary Cleveland's call for immigrants in the Cleveland community to share their stories as part of Global Cleveland's Welcoming Week. Tonight's program is also in connection with our current special exhibition, Stories of Survival, Object, Image, Memory. This landmark exhibit showcases more than 60 never before seen personal items brought to America by survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides. The exhibition is on display at the Maltz Museum now and will be through the end of February. You can visit the exhibition Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. in person, or you can also sign up for a virtual tour of the exhibit. See it from home on the first or third Tuesday of each month at 2 p.m. All programming this season is virtual. So now through February, just log on to explore other programs just like this one. They're all very exciting and we're proud of our season. Please uh, learn more about our programming and our tours. Register for both, register for everything on our website at www.maltzmuseum.org. This is an extraordinary exhibit and I hope you all get the chance to see it for yourself. There will be time for Q&A at the end of this program. Please send any questions you have for our panelists through chat to all panelists at the, any time during the program or throughout the Q&A. It's featured at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll be collecting those and I'll be back to facilitate Q&A throughout the program. Um, so we'll connect and we'll be reading your questions at the end um, after we, um, after we hear from our guests. So to start off tonight, I would like to introduce Joe Simperman of Global Cleveland and Lisa Chu of Literary Cleveland. Let's first meet Joe. Many of you may know him. He seems to be a local celebrity, if you ask me. Um, and so let's hear a little bit about him. Prior to joining Global Cleveland as its top executive, Joe Simperman served 18 years on Cleveland City Council, where he distinguished himself as a champion of the diverse peoples and cultures of Greater Cleveland. Joe, an immigrant son, grew up in a Slovenian speaking household on East 74th Street in the St. Clair Superior neighborhood of Cleveland. In 1997, he began the first of seven terms on Cleveland City Council. His diverse ward included the businesses and corporate offices of downtown, as well as the cultures of Asia Town, Tremont, Ohio City, and the old neighborhood. Joe, a German Marshall Fellow, assumed the leadership of Global Cleveland in April of 2016. He and his wife, Nora, live in Ohio City with their two young children. Welcome, Joe. Now for Lisa. Lisa Chu is an American Asian writer whose work has appeared in People Magazine, Ohio Magazine, the San Jose Mercury News, and anthologies including Cheers to Muses, Contemporary Works by Asian American Women, and Who's Your Mama? The Unsung Voices of Women and Mothers. She has a bachelor's in English from Case Western Reserve University and a master's in journalism from the Ohio State University. Her family immigrated to the United States from Canada in the mid-1970s. Welcome, Lisa. Joe, I'd like to ask you to get us started. If you would tell us about the origins of Welcoming Week and why this project is important to you personally. Good evening, Dahlia. Thank you. And thanks to the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage for sponsoring tonight's event. And I cannot wait to hear the fantastic speakers and writers who we're going to hear from tonight. It's a real treat. Uh, Global Cleveland was an organization that was formed 10 years ago to welcome, attract, and retain international newcomers to Northeast Ohio. Our goal is to do one thing, which is to attract as many people born outside the U.S., to come to Cleveland if they're already here to stay in Cleveland, if they're staying in Cleveland to make their lives uh, even better because we recognize how important it is, how much immigrants, refugees, international students, secondary migrants, and people born out the U outside of the U.S. make us thrive. 30 years ago, Welcoming Week started in New York City as an effort to highlight the incredible immigrants who live in and around the five boroughs. 
Quickly, other cities took that wonderful idea and started making it their own. And Cleveland, a few years ago, started Welcoming Week, where we started featuring some of our notable immigrants. There are so many here in Northeast Ohio who make our jobs, who make our homes, who make our neighborhoods and our schools, who make all the places where we live, recreate, and enjoy our lives that much better by them being here. As it stands right now in Northeast Ohio, we welcome over 3,000 people annually and have for the last 15 years, every year, year after year, to our community who come from places all over the world. Recently, many of you know that people are coming here from Afghanistan. And while we were initially to receive about 350 people, that number as of today in Cleveland is closer to 500. And next year, where we were to receive about 700 people from Afghanistan, next year we will receive probably over 1,000. Our community continues to welcome people. And what Welcoming Week does is it puts the highlight on people who were born outside of our country, who make all of Cuyahoga County better, and they make it better by being here. Welcoming Week is typically in September. Our events are free and open to the public. We have many of our Welcoming Week events on our website at globalcleveland.com. If you wanna look back a few years and see some of the people we've highlighted, as well as some of the incredible programs we've done, we would love for you to do it. One of the things that we're really excited about in partnering with the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage is that the stories of newcomers are stories that are unique to that person. But whether you're coming here from Germany, from Austria, from places like Israel or Afghanistan, Iraq, Hungary, Ukraine, or Canada, the fact is we want your welcome to be robust and we want you to know that Cleveland, while it may not be your first home, is certainly your home and a place that we want people to feel welcome. We thank you for letting us be part of this. We thank the writers for sharing their soul. And we're so excited to see everybody at Welcoming Week in September of 2022. Thanks, Dahlia. No, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm also the child of immigrants, although from Baltimore, not Cleveland originally, but the environment that Cleveland creates, um, even as someone who just came from out of town is so warm and welcoming and welcoming week um, is a really special thing that's happening. And we're so grateful to all that you're doing at Global Cleveland um, to make people from all over the world feel like this is home um, because home is a big question. What makes you feel like your home? Um, and that's something that we're hoping to really touch on tonight. Um, Lisa, you're also the child of immigrants. Tell us about what this project has meant to you personally, and also how did you get it off the ground with Literary Cleveland? It seems like a big project, but from what I understand, you might have done it pretty quickly. It did happen pretty quickly. I'm actually an immigrant myself, although I didn't think oh. of myself as one for a long time, but I'm, I'm a naturalized um, U.S. citizen, and i um, you know, I'm just so grateful for this whole collaboration. We didn't have welcoming week when my family moved to the US um, in the mid seventies. And so knowing that we have that here is something that um, I'm really happy to be a part of. And so um, a few years ago, Literary Cleveland had a call for submissions. Um, they were part of Cleveland Humanities Week. And that year the theme was immigration. Um, they had a call for submissions for a program they called Crossing Borders, Immigrant Narratives. And um, basically they brought stories to life with staged readings. And it was just a beautiful project and I was part of it um, and wanted, I wanted more. I wanted, I know there's so many stories out there and um, I wanted to help see if there's a way that we could showcase those. So um, I think it's important to, to do now um, it's part of Literary Cleveland's mission to amplify diverse voices. And I think especially in the past few years, we've seen some anti-immigrant sentiment in this country. And um, I think we're looking to build more walls. I mean, build more bridges and not walls. Um, and I think we also believe that the power of storytelling can be so profound in connecting people. Um, so, um, uh, our executive director, Matt Weinkem, was really receptive and enthusiastic about this idea. Um, and he reached out to Global Cleveland, um, to Cleveland Scene Magazine. And, um, and we also um, enlisted fellow Literary Cleveland board members, um, writers and immigrants, um, Jackie Feldman and Sujata Laki. And everybody along the way said, yes, let's, let's do this. Um, so um, we were really thrilled to 
help showcase these amazing um, storytellers and wish that there was more room to highlight more stories. So we're hoping that this is just the beginning, that there will be more opportunities to feature more writers and more venues. Um, so thanks. Lisa, thank you. Um, quick question for you. Um, of the of the um, group you've selected, um, was it incredibly difficult? Did, how many entries were you able to get um, in this short turnaround? I don't remember exactly how many entries we reviewed. I mean, I mean this we did this pretty quickly, um, and we were also you know limited with the space constraints. You know, I, I remember as we were reading them, we were thinking we could fill a whole journal. We could. There are so many stories there are so many um, wonderful voices um but we need this to be um limited for scene magazine um so I, you know we so hope there's this a future the beginning <laughs> that there will be bigger and more um in the future yes well i definitely think that sounds like a project that i look forward to um reading and participating in and filling, reading, seeing that journal come to life in the future. That's a really exciting idea. So thank you both, Joe and Lisa, for everything. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce tonight's panel of writers. Yay, bravo. We're so excited to have you. We're like busting at the seams with excitement. We've been looking forward to this program. Um, one of the selected writers, however, was unable to join us tonight, and I wanted to recognize her. Her name's Fatima Matar. And please, if you're able to read her work in Scene Magazine, if you get a chance, she is remarkable. In fact, she was just featured on IdeaStream, I understand, yesterday. Um, hopefully we can share that link with you. So um, we miss her tonight, but um, her work is available and we encourage you to check it out. Um, so for those wonderful writers who are here tonight, allow me to begin their introductions. Um, I'll introduce them. And then we're going to have a brief Q&A with them um, just to ground us in who they are a little bit. We'll hear from them and hear them read their beautiful pieces. And then we'll have a discussion about their works and do some analysis and some deep thinking and ask questions. And then there'll be room for audience Q&A. So just as a reminder, and anytime if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll be gathering those questions. Um, so first, Juwan Wu. Um, is your ordinary immigrant person who has many stories to tell. She has taught literature, writing, and humanities at Lorraine County Community College since 2013. She's a city lover, as she was born and raised in Seoul, South Korea. She came to the U.S. to pursue her graduate degrees in Iowa and Minnesota, and later moved to Cleveland. I also lived in Minnesota, Juwan, and then came to Cleveland. Um, so now this is her chosen home. Um, when she does not teach or research, she enjoys hiking in the valley, listening to audiobooks, sewing and cooking Korean food. Above all, she loves to spend time with her partner, daughter, and cat. Welcome, Juwan. Um, Clarissa Jacobsons was born in Hildesheim, Germany during the end of World War II. Her parents escaped Lithuania because the Russian communists were coming and, quote, they were worse than the Nazis, end quote. Poet, artist, instructor Clarissa was a twice featured poet in Paris, France at the Shakespeare and Company bookstore and winner of the Akron Art Museum New Words competition. Her work has been featured in the Raven Review, KSU Wick Poetry Center, Blue Nib, Hawaii Pacific Review, Yale Journal for Humanities and Medicine, and Caddy Wampus Press, among others. She is currently working on a manuscript of poems, the last stronghold and wishes to share her experiences so the past is not repeated. Jane McCourt was born and raised in Donetsk, Ukraine and immigrated to the United States with her family at the age of 21. She holds a degree in Russian, philo I'm so sorry, I wanna say philosophy, but I'm not sure that that's the right word. I'm not sure if it's- Philology. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You'll have to tell us what that is. Um, from Donetsk National University and degrees in psychology and human resources from Cleveland State University. Quite an accomplishment. In her early days in America, she worked in the Russian Acculturation Department of the Jewish Community Center of Cleveland. 
assisting new immigrant families and children from the former Soviet Union and teaching English as a second language. In her spare time, she writes in Russian and English, gardens, cooks, volunteers, and is always eager to learn something new. That was such an important period of time um, during the Soviet Jewry movement um, that actually started in Cleveland and became a, a national um, event. Sima, or sorry, Rima Sen, is currently working on her doctorate at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Rima, I believe, is um, actually right now tuning in from India. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us from um, far away and making us feel close. Um, she's lived in a number of different countries and worked in consulting, financial services, and nonprofits with a focus on diversity. She's an avid traveler and blogger who has explored 59 countries. Her first degree was in English literature, followed by an MBA, MSc in human rights and criminology, and an MA in sociology. My goodness. She continues to gather experiences in her pursuit of learning and writing. Welcome, Rima. So this is our exciting panel, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us tonight. I'd like to start our conversation off by asking, um, you know, with all your various experiences with writing, what prompted you to participate in this particular um, project at this particular time? Did you have a, pro a piece in your back pocket, or did you write in response to the prompt? Jane, maybe you want to get us started? Sure. Um, I'm less of a professional writer than anyone else here on the panel, and I'm, I'm very excited to be featured uh, next to all of you. I, um, I had this piece written as part of, I would say, autobiography that I started writing some years ago. Um, and I thought even if it never sees light and then never gets published, at least this is something that my children and grandchildren and kind of family will be able to reference. Um, and I think it really years ago, I, I, when I was in my early 20s, when I worked at the JCC at the acculturation department, actually it was with Jackie Feldman, who is also part of literally Cleveland and who is here tonight. Um, I, I was very young and I, I didn't reflect very much on uh, immigration experiences. Um, but I think as I got to that Dante's age reaching the uh, midway life, um, I started really questioning what that experience meant for me and, and my children. And what I what I found the journey for of an immigrant never ends. And what I find was the children of immigrants, just like my own children, um, they continue um, their quest for identity. So I think it's a very kind of interesting um, psychological factor of where uh, we draw this line between feeling truly at home as if it's your first home as opposed to finding, like in my case, my piece is searching for my second home. Thank you. Wow, I really, that resonated with me. A journey of an immigrant never ends. And even with my children, you said, we continue our quest for identity. I really relate to that. Um, and that was a beautiful statement. Clarissa, would you like to answer that question for us? Yes. What compelled me to enter? I was taken by the synchronicity of this opportunity to submit with my writings of The Last Stronghold, the poetry book I've been working on. And it's been quite painful working on the collection of poems because I have researched through my father's letters to my mother and some are in German, some are in Lithuanian. Um, and he was in taken away to Nazi camps and then the gulag. And um, then somehow miraculously, I was born in Hildesheim, Germany before he was taken away. So I'm just relating that it's been very difficult and being with 
the Maltz Museum, I think, is sort of a kick in the rear end to get this down and get it finished before it is too late. Plus, I do want to share what has transpired and so we don't make the same mistakes, you know, even if one person makes a realization of the past and what's happening in the present, uh, you know, that's a success. So it was really uh, quite remarkable to have this opportunity <laughs> to share with you and all of the wonderful organizations. So I feel truly blessed by all of your presence. Well, Carissa, thank you. Your um, words are so kind. And the Maltz Museum, I say on behalf of everyone, is grateful to you for telling your story. Um, I'm also the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. That's how I ended up an immigrant, right? She came to the United States, which my mother was originally from Hungary. And um, those stories are very hard to tell. And many um, people connected to such trauma choose not to speak. So your story, your willingness to share is courageous because it, it's it's a difficult journey to tell those stories. And so bravo to you. Um, we admire your courage and we, we look forward to all that's ahead for you. Um, thank you so much. Um, let's see, how about Rima? Hi everyone. Um, for me, I think um, I came to America at a time when there was a lot of churn, uh, a lot of uh, a whole new uh, political setup, and uh, a lot of social and political sort of volatility in a way, uh, divisive um, sorts of things going on. I was starting to to try to understand how I connect with the country, and I was starting to get more critical along the way. And this, someone wrote to me about this opportunity, and I hadn't really thought about it. But I was in the middle of a lot of stressful assignments, and I just dashed this out. In it was a way of trying to feel okay, connect with myself, and connect with what's going on around me. So um, I really enjoyed writing it, and I was trying to, I, I think, I sense that I was trying to do a, a sort of balancing act and weigh up um, what I liked or disliked about where I was and try to feel okay about it. And I think that's, that's where this came from. Um, and I, I thought it sounded really critical, and I was really surprised when it was accepted. And I think that's what's great about the literary um, community. You get to have your voice and you get to say um, what you want. And I think that's really important for, for everyone to understand. So thanks for that. Great to be here. You, Rima, thank you so much. Um, I loved what you had to say, a way to connect with myself and connect with what's around me. It's something we should really all be doing, but it does take on a special meaning when maybe there's a, a layered search for that, as Jane had said, um, you know, that constant quest for identity and, and what it means to feel at home. So it's really interesting. Thank you. And um, Joanne, um, please share share with us. Hi. Hi. Um... Thank you for the introduction, and I'm so honored to be all of you tonight. Um, when I saw the props on the Twitter, I thought, well, I never wrote any poems, even though I taught a lot. <laughs> so I thought I could write something about the language. Um, I love English. I was just fascinated by the sound and so many idioms, but myself, I know I never overcome my accent. So <laughs> I wanted to write about the feeling of having broken tongue in a society where um, vocal articulation often determines a person's value. And my own mother is a barely educated and I used to be a stutter child, <laughs> so. <laughs> I feel like I always carrying the broken tongues in me as a part of my identity. Um, so one night uh, I brought my nine-year-old daughter to the ice skating class 
and she was gliding so graciously and confidently, just like she can speak with a foreign tongue, with us so graciously. So I feel like there's some image of the broken eyes and the glass popping in my mind. So I could wrote that poem, uh, I could write that poem. I'm listening and while speaking, so it's annoying. <laughs> so I could write that poem right away uh, during her class time. So yeah, I, I did not expect I could write it, but I submitted and I, I feel very lucky to share the poem with you. Well, and we are so excited to hear it. What a gorgeous story. Um, and so eloquently told even just now, the, the language you've used absent of your poetry um, certainly doesn't feel broken in any way to me. It feels incredibly whole and thoughtful. So thank you so much for sharing that. I feel a little bit emotional listening to your story. Um, so, well, let's get into it. Let's hear what, what you've written. Um, Juwan, since since you've gone last and um, you're still on screen, why don't we hear that beautiful poem of yours? Thank you. Um, I have paper. Um, title is Accent. A word is broken into hundreds of pieces to become soundless shriek. In my boring mouth, the pieces fall down like a glass shard. To speak out that one word loud, my tongue must be scratched. This language tastes like a fresh wound from shame, scorching. Even silence never leaves it scabbed over. That's how I got an accent. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you, Juan. That was beautiful. Um, thank you. We'll be discussing these at the end. And remember to our audience, anyone who has a question um, or a comment to any of our um, writers or for Lisa or Joe, um, please feel free to pop those questions into the chat. Um, Clarissa, how about you? Let's hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Ragged Trail of Bones, after historical research by Daniel W. Michaels, retired Defense Department analyst and Fulbright scholar. The last man called to work detail was always shot. In articles and firsthand texts, I learned that under the Yalta provisions, the US, UK, and Russia agreed to use German prisoner of wars in re gulag reparations. Each laborer received less than one pound of black rye. Productive workers earned a tad of meat, sugar, veggies, or rice. Almost one million POWs died after a decade of forced labor. 10,000 men survived. My father lived. In 1945, Brit and US authorities ordered German militia forces to deport thousands of Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians to Soviet camps. Cattle cars transported 9 million prisoners, including my father. Selected women were raped, paraded naked in front of camp officials, promising easier workloads for sex. One out of three inmates died the first year. By 1953, 12 to 20 million perished. The death ritual succumbed to exposure, hunger, exhaustion, and malnutrition. A wooden marker with the deceased inmate's identity was affixed to his left leg. Gold fillings were extracted, preed, and cut. Skulls hammer smashed, chests spiked with metal rods, bodies thrown into unmarked graves. Somehow, 
my father survived Nazi concentration camps and the Soviet gulag in Stalingrad. Released beyond reason, he never mentioned the past ordeals harbored in his bones. Without question, silence reigned in our home. He spent days in quiet labor at his Solon Medical Office, Bedford and VA hospitals, doctoring patients to bring forth life. I research while the gulag system seems to disappear from our landscape, what can I do or say but remember to wipe clean the empty shoes lining riverbanks? And I have the purse here, which my mother was on the ship to Ellis Island with. And she saved so many things, but my father saved this wooden spoon he hand carved in one of the concentration camps so he could eat with dignity. Thank you for your patience. Marissa, thank you so, so much. Um, not only is your piece incredibly powerful and moving um, and important um, as we discussed earlier, but also your, the fact that you've included objects that have been carried um, from um, the Holocaust and brought to America is exactly what the current exhibition is about at the museum. Um, and it, it always makes us think and bring up the question, um, what would you carry? You know, we had to flee. Um, that spoon is so, it's an incredible artifact um, and the tie to dignity, just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, I'd like to ask Jane if she would like to read now. Thank you, and Clarissa's piece was very moving and I feel like we need a moment of silence in between the pieces, but not coincidentally, my piece continues this, uh, the dark Soviet theme and my piece references um, demise of post-Soviet space in my case, um, Eastern Ukraine, where I um, come from um, and um, uh, probably at least half of my motivation to start writing autobiography and start writing kind of reflection of on my journey was the fact that um, seven years ago, um, a, a conflict, I, I will try not to label it in a certain way because I know there may be people in the audience who feel one way or the other, but um, a conflict bro broke out and um, unfortunately, um, there is no end to it inside. And so it's it it haunts me. I do have some family and friends still in, in that region. And I go back to my you know, first 25 years, 21 years of life there. Um, and so this is just kind of keeps me from completing the circle. And I feel like that conflict is holding me back psychologically as well. So my piece is called In Search of My Second Home. On December 21st, 1997, my family loaded four canvas bags, one for each of us into a minivan that was to take us to the train station. In my most prized clothes is a deep green coat of rabbit, tall Italian boots and a black alpaca hat that made me feel like I might just fit in America. I said goodbyes to a couple of friends and neighbors who gathered around the van. I tried hard to contain boss my excitement for the journey ahead and my guilt for leaving them behind in the place that seemed to have no hope. I had taken trains many times before and did not immediately recognize that this was the last train out of my childhood and out of my homeland. We finally found the right platform and were standing there cold and silent waiting for a train to pull in. Everyone's eyes were fixed on the platform clock. This last minutes must have been agonizing for my mother and my grandparents, Lisa and Simon. For many years, they, we were one big family 
nine in total, bundled together in a small apartment. Nobody questions privacy when your corded telephone, yes, we were lucky to have our own, is in the middle of the hallway and secured to the washroom's outer wall. Even when my grandfather, World War II, World War II veteran, qualified for a second apartment owing to a growing family, we stayed barely a 10-minute walk apart. An approaching train broke up the awkward silence. We picked up our bags and trotted forth. Suddenly, my grandfather's sweeping cut the dusk. Goodbye, Zhenichka, we will not see each other again. There were many immigration agencies all busy calling, processing, and stamping like clockwork. Years later, it occurred to me that the country was still missing one most important office that would account for the value of people. Jews became synonymous with the term Soviet immigration, but the brain drain was not limited to Jews. Between 1991 and 2014, nearly a million of ethnic Russians fled Ukraine. And since the outbreak of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine, this figure grew by another half a million. As a result of an accelerating down spiral in post-Soviet Ukraine, countless ethnic Ukrainians and other nationalities leave daily to seek living wage and shelter elsewhere. When our train arrived in Kiev the following morning, we were in for a big treat. My uncle Anatoly, who left for America four years prior, was on the job assignment in Russia and traveled to Kiev to meet us. The next day, a plane took us from Sheremetyevo to Charles de Gaulle Airport. This was my first airplane ride and first time being outside the Soviet borders. Another plane ride and a loud cheer of the passengers was followed by the outline of the Hudson River on the horizon. One final plane took us from New York City to Cleveland. My second set of grandparents, Lisa and Misha, were anxiously waiting at the end of the terminal. I clearly remember hugs, kisses, and cries of joy coming from my grandmother. But the most amazing sight was the big smile on Grandpa Misha's face, an ever emotionless face of a man broken down by Parkinson's disease. Our entire journey took all but one day, yet almost a quarter century later, I feel like I'm still wedged between the two sides of the world, waiting to learn of my true destination. Maybe I feel this way because my story began in Donetsk, Eastern Ukraine, and everything is equivocal about this region. A hybrid war in the center of Europe now surpassed seven years and has become a never ending frozen conflict with a whole generation of first graders growing up in bomb shelters, elderly collapsing at the blog post on the way to collect their meager pensions and all the rest aging and dying much faster than their biological clocks summon them to. By and by, with no progress made toward resolution, the conflict rarely picks anyone's interest anymore. It seems as if everyone long settled accounts for themselves. When I introduced this topic in the conversation, I received puzzled looks as if there is no controversy to it whatsoever. Everything published in Russian is pro-Russian. Everything published in Ukrainian is pro-Ukrainian and nearly everything published in English is anti-Russian. A revised Cold War ages on, and we former Soviets know too well how swiftly history can be rewritten. I often go back to my last moments in Donetsk, to my prophetic dream where I see bombardiers in the dawn sky and hear people screaming, to the final few days in our empty apartment with heavy duty canvas bags, thoroughly sewn by my mother, lying in the hallway. Suddenly, Everything goes dark and quiet in my dream. I'm in America, working at the bookshop, longing for a bibliophile young man to strike a conversation. Hey. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. That was stunning. Um, I feel a little bit overwhelmed. You packed in an incredible amount of emotion and storytelling into a very short piece, really. Um, I have a million questions um, to ask you about your experience and your writing is beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, right now we're going to go on to Rima um, and then we'll take time to all talk together. Rima? So I feel really overwhelmed actually listening to the three of you, that was fantastic. My piece is in a, in a much lighter vein, very tongue in cheek and sort of grounded in the here and now. 
So um, it's kind of longish, but uh, let's have a go. America was the fifth new country I tried to make my home. I am a bit of a rolling stone and accustomed to friends inquiring jokingly, where in the world are you now? It's also a question I ask myself constantly while trying to set roots down somewhere. Enrolling oneself in a PhD program in an American university forces you to settle down long, longer term, five years this time. It was nice to be able to speak and understand the language, as opposed to when I was trying to live in Hong Kong in China. I remember having to draw an airplane for the taxi driver in China who was heading to the train station when he saw me with a suitcase. I have to admit, it took a little um, adjusting to get used to the English spoken in the US, as opposed to the Queen's English that I'm accustomed to growing up in post-colonial India, being educated in an Irish convent school, and then working in a British bank in London. It's not just the missing use, color, labor, neighbor, but the accent and some grammatical quirks, which are different and made it distinctly American. But that would be incorrect since America comprises 35 countries, the US being just one of them. So how then should I describe the US specifically? The country of Hollywood, Starbucks, Big Bucks, or Black Lives Matter, food deserts, and drive-by shootings. When I first heard Michael Jackson's Black or White, it didn't really hit home like it did when I got here. I realized it's all about black or white, what is brown but a shade of black, and wouldn't it be nice if we were really colorblind? Race trumps, no pun intended, even class and gender. This pervasive narrative is something I was unprepared for, uncomfortable with, and it's impossible to ignore the history of this country, which is more than a mirror of other colonizers. Native Americans tend to get obscured in the fray sometimes. And the dynamics for an outsider are fascinating, frustrating, formidable, fractious, and festering. Indulge my posho for alliteration. I have to say, I'm still trying to understand this country where people sit in their car for hours on end, despite living in large houses compared with the bite-sized condos in Hong Kong, Tokyo, or Mumbai. Doing what exactly? where there are endless varieties of pet food and fashion in supermarkets. I'm trying not to think of the refugees I worked with and the dedication to dogs that locals demonstrate, where most meetings begin with chit-chat about pets, markedly different from the weather-related chit-chat in Britain or food-related chit-chat in Bangladesh, where I'm still trying to figure out what soul food really is. Just homemade comfort food like mac and cheese, or is it to do with the music genre and its roots that cry out with genuine passion? The outdoor staple is barbecued meat and corn on the cob, as opposed to the culinary expertise of even the ordinary street chef in Asia. However, only here there's Mitchell's ice cream and Mason's creamery and some beefy, cheesy soups to die for and Louisiana seafood boil. Who would have thought it could be spicier than Shanghainese crawfish? Not to mention a sterling selection of pale ales and stouts, freshly brewed every few miles. Here is the Cleveland Museum of Art with its magnificently curated collection and motto of free for all. The orchestra at Severance Hall, the variety at Playhouse Square, and the multitude of hiking trails. Here, I experience stunning seasonal landscapes faithfully every year. Freezing fairy tale snow vistas, just like my childhood storybooks in India. Flaming trees in fall and the lush green of summer. The picture perfect tulips in spring and gardens flushed with bergamot, geranium, lavender, carpets of wildflowers. Spectacular sunsets from the Solstice steps on the Sweetwater Lake that feels like an ocean. Who would have imagined chanting upon myriad mushrooms in all shapes, colors, and sizes as you walk through parks with rabbits and squirrels and deer merrily scampering about and giant turtles ambling along the lakeside with the occasional blue heron majestically taking flight. At the same time, a gaggle of geese squawk their way at dusk in an unerringly straight line 
and robins kingfishers uh, reminds me of Indian bear and blue jays flit about happily. I love the space, freedom, and privacy here, coming from the world's most densely populated country. And yes, I have discovered lately a community of writers, book lovers, who make me feel quite at home. The air is clean, the people have voted, the opportunities are immense, and people still read, curl up at Loganberry Books anytime, and write. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you. It was really lovely on so many levels, but I think your description of Cleveland through your lens, I thought was so charming. And, um, you know, there's, um, I always said my mother was the, um, like loved America, like more than any, she never wanted to leave. She never wanted to travel anywhere because she was so grateful to be here. And I had that sense from you about, you know, sort of what you were seeing and taking it in. So I thought that was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up for a discussion with everyone. And Lisa, if you're available, um, and Joe, um, you know, we'd love to also hear from the two of you um, about some of these questions that are um, coming up. I The first thing I want to bring up um, is about, um, we've talked a little bit about your inspiration for writing, but I'm, I'm curious if you also have um, something that you're really hoping, if you had to say in a word what you're hoping or in a sentence, what you're hoping someone takes from your piece and takes from reading all the pieces. Dalia, I think you cut in and out a little bit, at least for me, so I didn't get to hear what your question was. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I asked, um, we heard a little bit already about your inspiration behind writing these pieces, but I'm wondering, what do you hope to get out, you know, others um, that are here on the program tonight or those who've read your pieces and seen, um, what's the takeaway that you hope that they capture from reading your pieces, from your peers' pieces, um, Lisa, Joe, what you hope, um, you know, the community is gaining from this project. The, the, all, every poem and essay was stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, I don't see Joe, so I, Clarissa, you're you're not muted, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you if you'd like to. to you, well, I see we are all connected. Our feet have come from various countries and we have gone through difficult times assimilating. I, um, I had a black star on my forehead all day in kindergarten by the nun. Um, I was picked on because I was learning, trying to learn English. And even in eighth grade, there was a boy who typed a semi letter. And at the end of it, it said, go back to Germany. You're a Nazi. I was in eighth grade. So things were, were difficult and I still feel like, you know, what country do I really belong in? You know, where, although my feet are grounded here in the Cleveland area ever since I was a junior in high school. But I guess there's a DNA and, you know, things are in our bones from our ancestors and all. And that makes us who we are. And our feet are planted here in the Cleveland area. And we share willingly to others. You're all good people. We've gone through misfortunes and we want to help others not to go through distresses that we've gone through. So we need to share. We need, students don't seem to be learning a lot about history and 
it's unfortunate. How can you not repeat history if you are not aware of what has happened in the past? And so those are a few words, a few ideas that have flexed in my mind. Thank you. Thanks, Clarissa. Anybody want to to lead off off that? Jane, Juan, Rima, Lisa, Jane. Um, I can go next. Well, I think peace to the world. <laughs> That's a big message. I think that we all are are sending um, continuously was was our stories and experiences. But even on the you know, smaller scheme of things, anyone who um, reads and, and internalizes those stories, I think will benefit tremendously, not just learning history, but also becoming more tolerant and humble and developing the more humility. And um, I'll just end with uh, one story um, from my journey. I, um, I branched out into human resources um, kind of after completing a degree in psychology and studying literature and so on, and just as a practical career choice that seemed the right choice at the time. And so I, um, I sat a lot in the boardrooms with you know, white males. And I remember um, 15 years ago, and um, some instances I was the only woman and immigrant at the same time. And um, there were several instances when comments were made to me directly or to me through my boss about my accent. And it was really kind of like, how could she <laughs> be here with us at the same table with us discussing those corporate matters? She's an immigrant, she has an accent. Um, interestingly enough, I have seen a, a tremendous change in that, as I said, over my experience goes back about 15 years. Um, and I think that um, Americans overall um, and corporate culture became a lot more tolerant um, toward immigrants. So I think we are seeing a lot of positive changes. I do agree with Clarissa that we're not doing enough and sometimes there are movements and propaganda that I think are counterintuitive and actually damaging our children. I don't agree with everything that my children hear at school and, and hear in the media. Um, but overall, I think we have to hope that there is kind of a positive shift that's happening in society. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to add to that. That reminds me. Um, when I was in grade school, I learned history from the books. And my parents, they would switch languages when they didn't want me to know what they were saying. Yeah, from Lithuanian to Russian to uh, Polish. And, and, you know, then years later, it took how many years? And it's like, oh my gosh, my parents were right. This really did happen because I was living in two different worlds, in the world that was given in school and then the world at home, which, you know, was a little, little weird, but it's like they were right all along, but I didn't, I didn't know. So it just came to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can add on that. I mean, the, I would not see myself as an immigrant all the time. And I have, I have a happy family and we have so much joy and joke and humors and going on every day, which barely noticed by other people when they friend us as a just immigrant. And they're, they have all the single story, like striving to survive in this country. But there are so many multi layers of the stories that we can share and that we only understand because we already understand what kind of background we have. So when I wrote this poem, and my audience is not the majority of American people. I, I just wrote this poem for the people just like me who are kind of split between different languages and different cultures. And I just want to say, I feel for you. I feel with you. 
and in the way we are together. <laughs> um, so I, I think the rhetoric, even though I can see there's some progress on the attitude toward the immigrants, but I still believe um, kind of stereotype like a mother minority, those things are so dangerous in a way that re, uh, they set the immigrant against other people of color in this country. Uh, at the same time, reinforce the white supremacy and racism. So I like to see more, well, because the bell hooks passed away today, <laughs> if I can borrow her words, when we recognize everybody has a story to tell. And those stories compels us to have a conversation about differences, which we have thought inconceivable, but we need to share that. So yeah, well, what I wanna say through the, this experience talking about the immigrant experience is not introducing ourselves to somebody else, but just create a common ground to start up our conversation about the differences. That was really, that was a great response. Um, everyone's responses are, Amazing. The, the um, one of the things that I heard that I I, I want to note is the danger of the single story, um, and how it propagates prejudice, um, and also um, the way you use the word immigrant. Whether uh, I think it might have been unintentional in the opening, you said, um, if I understood correctly, that. You, um, you don't think of yourself as an immigrant, you're a happy family. And which automatically made me think that you're interpreting the word immigrant as a negative word, um, as unhappy, as other, right? And, um, and that association, even for someone, you know, as an immigrant, like that association with the word is quite powerful, but also how people have made you feel about the word. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think it should be a word we celebrate after all. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, oh, somebody's noted in the in the comments. I just I want to um, said there's a similar conversation around the use of the term minority, um, immigrant minority. That there's a negative association with words that um, really make up the fabric of our community. Right? Everybody is ultimately from somewhere or has a culture that defines them um, or multiple cultures, multiple identities. I mean, that's really something at the museum that we talk a lot about um, is, is who, who we are. Um, and you're all so exemplary of that. We're never just one thing, um, multiple identities. Rima, did you have anything that you wanted to add to this conversation? Um, yes, and I think I'll partly respond to Will's question in the chat about how the stories I tell um, reflect the, the different countries that I've been in and how people respond. And I think, I think really what I try to do, and that goes on in my head all the time, is that there is no hierarchy. There's not this country is better than that. There's positives and negatives everywhere. And I think I, what I try to do is highlight differences and that differences are okay, it's normal, and that everybody's different, but we all live under the same sky. And I think people start to get that. And it's interesting that um, you know the responses I get are more around the positives than the negatives, which is really great. So people don't naturally latch on to what is not so you know what is contentious or what is problematic in a country um more of the conversations tend to happen around the positives and um again it's it's not isolated everything's linked together so then you get into a broader conversation uh like jayvon was saying we need to have these conversations so if you start to people start to get a a, a better picture of a country because unless you're there what you what you see in a Hollywood film or what you read in a book is not what is necessarily real or you build a, a picture in your mind which you then don't want to move away from whereas things are changing all the time uh, so yes and and labels 
labels bother me um, when we when we use words like immigrant and minority. Um, I think they have been labeled in a way that that's how people look at that word. They they don't see beyond what they think is an immigrant, and that would mean you know all the connotations around. Uh, color of skin, accent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know the food you eat, or uh, you know the whatever um, cultural stereotypes that people tend to have. So I think we we do need to maybe change the labels if you really need to have labels, or uh, look at building a different sort of narrative. Thank you, Rima. Um... Yeah, the um, the cons we all live under one sky. You said, and differences are normal, right? <laughs> Nobody's like we're not carbon copies of one another, certainly in any capacity. You also mentioned something interesting about the value of travel. Um, you know, of, of stepping into a land and that you can't really experience another culture. Um, this is what I interpreted. Um, unless you're there through books or Hollywood, but do you find, um, and this is for anyone, um, Lisa, I really, I wanna hear from you too, that the, um, that one of the most important ways that we can explore culture and diversity, if we aren't, if we don't have the opportunity to travel is through books, um, especially by, um, you know, people of, um, from that culture, they're translated, um, or, or even if they're, um, you know, origin stories. So I'm just, I'm curious about what you guys think about the importance of multiculturalism in books um, and making sure young people or anyone is, are reading those. Lisa? Okay, I guess I'll go. Yeah, I think we saw it just from tonight, just from hearing um, these four women sharing their perspectives and experiences through such powerful writing. Um, it really expands your worldview and your perspective. Um, and yet we all feel connected with this shared sense of humanity, right? Um, the worst of what humans are capable of and, and the best in welcoming um, new perspectives and new um, ideas. So I, you know, I just love being part of this project and connected to all of you um, and just really admire your um, courage and your um, writing talents. Um, I know I, I want to connect this back to the idea of welcoming week um, and just, you know, the um, the breadth and richness of the experiences of the, the residents of Cleveland. Um, I know there are so many more stories like this, and I hope that we can hear more. Um, and Dahlia, thank you for faci facilitating this and providing a format and forum for these stories. I, I mean, it was just so moving. Thank you, Lisa. We, you know, if not for you and your team and Global Cleveland and Scene, you know, it takes um, it takes some initiative to start a project like this. But I agree with you. Just from these incredible four women here with us tonight, I feel um, I feel a little bit closer to um, to Cleveland, to the people that make up Cleveland. And um, we had a, a beautiful comment from someone. I'm not sure if you all got a chance to see, but I'd like to share it with the audience before we close for tonight. Um, and she said, thank you to each of you. Listening to all of you, I feel closer to my immigrant self than I have in a long time. And specifically to Lisa, thank you for breathing life into this project. So bravo. Um, in Hebrew, we say kol hakavod. Um, well done. Um, so that's gonna be it for tonight. But we hope to make this an ongoing project um, and to see all of you again, um, if not next year, at the museum sometime soon. Please come see um, Stories of Survival. We're free on MLK Day um, and, um, and we're open through the holiday season. So thank you all. Thank you. Matt and Lisa from Literary Cleveland, Joe from Global Cleveland, Scene Magazine, um, and Clarissa, Jane, Rima, Joan. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. This has been recorded and we will share the recording with you so you can share it with your friends. Many blessings to everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>